You're still watching The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. It's time to see the stories making round on our national dailies this morning. And joining us to review the papers is Professor Camilo Sani Fage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kano. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining us as always. Hello, sir. Good, Good morning. morning. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so let's just dive right into the papers. And today we'll be starting with Nature News. So there's a small headline here that says EU partners Nigeria on comprehensive residential energy survey. What are your what what are your thoughts on that one? The EU partner with Nigeria. I mean, the president of I've been looking for partners, I've been looking for investors, and now we're seeing the EU partners with a Nigeria on comprehensive residential energy survey. What's your take on that? I think that this is a good thing that um, at least we, one of our major problem is up to now we are yet to know ourselves in terms of uh, our population, all basic statistics that uh, you know are essential for policy making. So I think if we have um, uh, external or foreigner coming to uh, partner with us on this issue. I think it's a good thing, uh, especially we are talking of EU, which has uh, you know tremendous experience on the area. So I think this is one of the major achievements that we can say the government will uh, get if they are able to uh, uh, get the partnership. Mm. So, but what impact do you think this can make for um, Nigeria and on, you mean, I mean, Nigerian homes? Because we're talking about um, residential energy survey, so we're talking about homes now. So what impact can this possibly make? You see, it will help us in a long way um, because unless you know basic statistics on the energy need, the consumption and other things, you cannot be able to... Uh, you know, supply, uh, let's say, for example, e electricity, uh, water, and other things, you cannot be able to adequately cater for Nigerians. So if you have an adequate uh, su survey, uh, you may have basic data, which will enable you to now plan ahead and address this issue. For example, um, since Sunday, I think the national grid has collapsed. Yeah. These are part of the things that... Uh, you know, we are overloading it. There is no statistics. So where we have basic statistics like this, I think that will go a long way towards addressing our energy needs in Nigeria. Well, we hope that the national grid won't collapse again since um, this partnership might just be impactful as, as we hope it will be. Um, anyway, so let's move over to another. Okay, you have, you have, you have something to say? Go ahead. Yeah, I'm saying it will not be so soon. You know... But it will take a time to get the statistics and then plan ahead. But mm. uh, this is for future, not immediate solution to the problem that we are having now. Yes, but I want to believe that they are already working on that. I mean, in the last few years, we've seen the, the national grid collapse a number of times. So if they're saying a survey, I want to believe a survey has been done before now. And what are they doing to even stop the national grid collapsing? We can't be the giant of Africa and we're in darkness. Don't you think? You see, the problem is we could have the surveys, we could have the data, but uh, the policymakers uh, may not be using it. So having the statistics, having the survey and everything is one thing, but it is very important that we use the data to plan ahead and uh, go ahead and implement the policy that we plan. Mm. Well, I agree with you. All right, let's move over to another headline. It says miners, operators, or federal government, two trillion naira in royalty and taxes. This is from Delhi Alake. So he's saying the miners and operators, or the federal government, about two trillion naira in royalties and taxes. So we're in debt. And the miners are still, Nigeria is in debt. The miners yeah, well, are in debt to Nigeria, who is in debt. This is, a, this is a, a whole lot for me to take in, but I want to hear what your thoughts are on this one. Two trillion naira in royalty and taxes. You see, most, most, most of the, um, 
mining uh, companies, uh, informant, they are illegal. So that is why you cannot have uh, such huge amount of revenue that uh, will go, uh, which is supposed to come to the government, but right? because they are illegally operating or informally operating, uh, that is why we don't have it. And the other thing is uh, corruption. You know, there is even the agents who are supposed to get uh, to assess the tax and to get it for the government, they are, you know, being bright uh, with small talking and they will uh, not care to, or they will turn their heads uh, uh, away from the issue. So I think this is a major thing. At this, in this time, when, uh, you know, we are in cut crunch, when the economy is uh, in uh, difficulties, uh, I think everybody should have uh, have the national uh, decent to so that uh, people should not be owing the government uh, uh, taxes, especially companies that are making a lot of money. And the other uh, the irony of it is that some of these companies are even owned by foreigners, so uh, they use in connivance with uh, some Nigerians to deprive Nigeria of such huge amount of money. Mm. So I know that um, I know that in other countries, for instance, in the U.S., you hear of people um, evading taxes. You hear of tax evasion a lot of times. Um, and sadly, we live in a country where, you know, sometimes someone just has to grease the other person's palm and they look the other way. But why do you think people try to evade taxes if you have been able to make, you know, so much money and then you have some resources that is acquired, such as infrastructure, um, roads, power, and all of the things that actually aids your establishment for you to make that money, why shouldn't you be paying the taxes to the government? So why do people evade tax so much in Nigeria? I of it is because the sanction is weak. Uh, in other places that I uh, mentioned, uh, the sanction is very high, very tough. Whoever evades taxes, no matter the person, once he's caught, uh, there are those that will deal with you. But here in Nigeria, you know, people uh, easily get uh, away from such. And secondly, like I said earlier, is the issue of corruption. Uh, the people that are assigned or, or the officials that are supposed to assess and collect the tax are corrupt. So you give them the small talking and somebody run away with it. In other words, it is easy uh, for people to evade taxes in Nigeria. Even if they are caught, it is easy uh, for them to evade the law. So that is why uh, this uh, evasion of tax is very frequent in Nigeria. Mm. Well, I hope that, if, you know, for everyone who, <laughs> who tries to evade the taxes, you know, they are prosecuted because in the U.S., people go to jail for tax evasion. People serve time for tax evasion. In Nigeria, we really don't see that sometimes people just say oh don't worry i can work it for you but we're hoping that we start to have a, a nation that is that has integrity i think that's the word that has integrity if you are making money you should be able to pay your tax and that should be it all right let's move over to the guardian and the major headline here says duty increase spot fx rate adoption throw market into panic and yeah that's where we are. So every day the FX has been rising over the past couple of months. And now we're seeing duty increase as well. Um, the duty for people who are importing stuff, it's increased. And all of that just throws the market into panic. What is your take on this one? You see, uh, in, in the last uh, maybe 24 hours or so, the, the government, uh, the custom has read the duty twice. And uh, is throwing the country into panic. Uh, already, uh, you know, we are consumers. We consume what we import. We import, we import what we consume. And uh, by the time you raise taxes, uh, it means that inflation will go high, as we are witnessing now. Secondly, it means the living condition of Nigerians will deteriorate, as we are witnessing now. And so I think it's a very, very negative policy that uh, the, the uh, government is doing based on uh, on that issue. But what they are saying is they are trying to, uh, you know, take the taxes along with uh, the dollar. So yes, the dollar as the Naira, you know, falls uh, against the dollar, they, they raise it uh, 
twice like I said. So we don't know how many times they are going to do it. In fact, some people are saying uh, from the story that uh, if care is not taken at this rate, some few things that uh, Nigerians uh, buy like 100,000 now, it may be, I mean, 10,000 or so, it may go to up to 100,000 and so, like staple food, like other basic necessities, which uh, we all import. Well, I don't even think it's soon. I think it's happening now already. Um, you, you, something that you bought for about, let's say, 10000 before now, you're seeing it double and triple in price. So it's happening already. That's where we are. That's the reality that we live in right now as Nigerians. But I want to flip the script a little bit. Now, if we're talking about um, the import duty being increased and all of these taxes, shouldn't that, you know, stop us from importing too much because we're, we are a country that consumes everything imported. For instance, you go to a, to a supermarket and you see something that is made in Nigeria, nine out of 10 times, most people want to pick up the one that is imported because they think that that has um, some form of superiority over the one that is made in Nigeria. They feel like the made in Nigeria products are inferior. But if we keep importing you know, all of these products or the produce that we use, that definitely, you know, makes our currency weak. We are at the mercy of the dollar or whatever X FX rate, um, F FX currency that we're, we're using. So shouldn't this, you know, kind of motivate us to start to work or start to manufacture the things that we produce? We've seen that happen in China. So shouldn't that be what we're looking at right now in Nigeria? Yeah, this is what we should be doing, but it, it takes two to tangle. One, right. uh, the issue that uh, you know most of our industries have collapsed, and secondly, is the fact that uh, really most of our products are uh, substandard. They cannot compete with uh, uh, what uh, we import. And thirdly, and most importantly, is the fact that the all over the world, government tend to have protection. They, they tend to protect their basic things and they tend to, you know, uh, advertise that you should buy home made or uh, 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 products. Even in America, you see that they campaign too much about buying American, uh, for, by Americans. But here yeah, we don't do that. And the government thinks that by liberalizing, by opening the market to compete, that will help us. It will never help us. Because what they are bringing out is far superior than our own. And uh, there is no incentive by the government to make the domestic producers to compete favorably with the uh, foreigners. So I think this, there are a lot of factors. And above all, there is this psychological thing that uh, we have an uh, inferiority complex. We feel that anything foreign is superior than our own. So unless we take uh, the campaign to you know, enlighten the people on the need uh, to consume what to produce, uh, rather than to rely on the uh, uh, importance even to speak, we import it. And we think if we take the two speak, Nigerian to speak, and uh, uh, maybe foreign imported, people will think the, the imported one is better. Perhaps the only thing that Nigerians uh, think uh, is better than the important one, I think, is uh, what they call the cocoa wire. That, that is the electricity wire that uh, we <laughs> have cables. other than that. But mm. actually, everything. Yes, actually, everything Nigeria we think is superior, and uh, so there is that psychological inferiority complex also that contributes to this uh, penchant for importation. Well, I mean, you, you mentioned about the, the fact that, you know, some products might be inferior and substandard. But I think isn't that where the standards organization of Nigeria comes in to ensure that the products or the whatever we're producing is, you know, adequate, has adequate quantities and materials. The standard doesn't fall below, you know, whatever has been set. Where does the standards organization of Nigeria come in? It is there, it is supposed to do, but you know, we go back to the same issue of corruption. Mm -hmm. You know, with a few things, people like Greece hands and uh, the official will, will turn their way, a pace uh, away from the issue. So I think uh, we, we have to take a holistic approach 
a fighting corruption in you know a, a enlightening the people so that at least we now have a sense of pride in our nation we have a sense of pride in what we produce and the government should create a conducive uh, environment for uh, producers to do so if we have all these multiples that is why it works so even if you have standard organization uh, it is there but like I said, it's of corruption. Uh, the, the, that is why we don't have a steep uh, regulation of, uh, you know, standard. Mm. Okay, let's, let's just move away from that a little bit. There's a small headline here that says, your policies promoting despair, article tells Tinubu. What do you think about that? This is the um, presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, and he is um, addressing the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Bola Metinibu, that his policies are promoting despair. What do you think? Do you think the, the policies of the president, I mean, he's just been, is less than a year in our office right now, but do you think the policies so far are promoting despair in Nigeria? Uh, really, they are. Uh, politics aside, we, we shouldn't. We should set aside who said it. But the reality is that Nigerians, uh, you know, are despaired about uh, uh, what is happening now. Uh, we said it that um, inflation is uh, very high, and you know, uh, just now we, we talk about you buy something uh, a week ago also at a hundred naira also, or uh, now at ten thousand naira, it is now about that. Uh, so you see the living standard, uh, the heart of inflation and poverty, these are things that make Nigerians uh, despair, they, they make them a little bit worried and uh, the government is losing support, you know, in, in Nigeria. And we said, like, like I said, let's take our, our aside that uh, Atipu is an opposition, but even the United Nations, they pick you know, last week I think there was a statistics which said that um, uh, uh, one in every ten hungry person in the world is in Nigeria. So, you see, these are some of the things that the reality on ground that will make Nigerians not happy uh, because of the living standard. And you see it in so many places. People have started coming out protesting that uh, the living standard is, is bad. So, I think what the government needs to do is not to uh, play into politics about it. Even though it's an a opposition, the government should critically look at this uh, issue in order to see how they address it. Unless they do that, I think that they will lose support uh, or they are uh, drastically losing support among Nigerians. Mm. Okay, um, let's move over to security matters. So um, there are two headlines here that I want to look at here on The Guardian. It says, kidnapping epidemic, a failure of intelligence action at federal capital. And then there's another headline here that's talking about the AKT state um, school children and teachers who have regained their freedom. However, the driver was killed. But talking about the kidnapping um, epidemic, a failure of intelligence action at the federal capital, do you think it's the intelligence that is the problem? Or do you think it is not being acted upon that is the problem? So, you know, we can propose and say this is, this is what the problem is. Um, um, we need intelligence, we need process information, we need this and that. But are we really doing anything with the information that we get, the intelligence in court that we get? Are we doing anything with it? So what do you think is the problem? Because if they're saying that a failure of intelligence, you know, is the problem, what, what is your take on that? Do you think that's what the problem is, the root cause of the matter? Yeah, it's, it's a combination of both. The failure, one, it means we, we don't have the intelligence, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, intelligence is the surest way to, you know, end uh, um, uh, this uh, issue of insecurity. Because by the time you prevent it, you hear it up from taking place, that is when you are secured. But if it happens, then it's good. You know, the system has collapsed. That is one thing we don't have it. Secondly, even if we have it, um, we don't use it. So part of the failure is not having it. Another part of the reason for the failure is having it but not using it. And the third reason for the failure is there is lack of synergy between all the elements. For example, DSS will have a security intelligence 
the port police will have their own military will have their own and but there is no attempt to see that there is uh, these things so that is why we have it and uh, we also live in a set of denial by the time you get these things we take deny its uh, existence if there are facts uh, security intelligence report sometimes we deny it uh, and then if you deny uh, the existence of the problem you are not taking any step towards uh, yeah, you know, solving it. So I think this failure is a combination. It, it manifests itself in so many things, like I said earlier. Okay, so let's just move over to the punch. We're still on the same matter, which talks about the kidnapping epidemic. And um, that is the major headline on the punch. It says fundraising for ransom persists. Ekitipupil's families pay 15 million naira. And the writer here says victims, relatives, friends, neighbors raised ransom, school driver killed. And that is being said by the proprietor. Um, kidnappers slain slash slain Quara monarch widow's ransom to 40 million an hour suspected um suspect arrested so now we're talking about ransom i know in 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 my head or how it's been said before is we do not negotiate with terrorists and you shouldn't even pay ransom in fact we've, we've had cases where the the security department will come and say no you shouldn't engage with these people and try to pay ransom but we're seeing here that um the families and the friends and colleagues of these people, you know, paid 15 million naira ransom. Are we in the in in this era? Are we in this era of, you know, kidnapping and paying ransom? Is this now the the way for people to just easily make money because they know that if I kidnap this person, I'm going to it's going to be a payday for me. And I know that the government is not going to do so much to find me, investigate and prosecute me. So is this where we are now? And it's sad if that's where we are. But how can we get out of this pit of a hole? Kidnapping and ransom is now becoming a business. Yeah. People are making huge money out. It's a business. People are making huge money out of it. That is why they keep on trying it. And secondly, is the fact that uh, the government has not been able to address the issue. They are only saying that uh, people should not pay, uh, that it is illegal for people to pay. It's like you say, uh, negotiating with uh, terrorists. But what can the people do? You yeah. cannot have somebody, his loved one, uh, has been abducted. And uh, if he allows the loved one, it's either he's going to be killed or he's going to be maimed. And the government is doing nothing. So uh, it is left to the people. Uh, to, to now pay the ransom in order to get the, uh, you know, loved ones out of, uh, uh, from the hands of the terrorists, if we can use the word like that. So I think what we have to do is the government to make sure that uh, it's head of uh, this issue of kidnapping. And it goes back to what we have said earlier on, that uh, there should be intelligence report. By the time you have intelligence report, you can leave the scene in the bar before it takes a, a place. Where it fails, where it happens, it is the responsibility of the government to rescue the people. You shouldn't allow the victims' family to be, you know, the ones in charge. What are they going to do? It's a double jeopardy. They are now suffering the fact that. Uh, they have been uh, abducted, and now they are paying, they have to get money to pay it on their own. And now you are saying it is illegal. There, there was a time even the National Assembly was muting the idea of even uh, punishing those who pay the ransom. So what do you want to do? If you cannot rescue, if the government cannot rescue them, uh, they allow it to, uh, they put the blame on the shoulders of, I mean, the responsibility on the shoulders of the the family. So I think the government uh, shouldn't come out and say it is illegal because in the first place it is the responsibility of the government to prevent it from happening. If it, happen, uh, if it happens, it is the responsibility of the government to arrest the, uh, the situation. It is also the responsibility of the government to push out uh, the perpetrators and punish them so it will deter others from doing it in the future. All right, um, there's, there's a headline here that might just interest you, and it says, NSCDC trains vigilantes to secure, to secure 821,000 um, vulnerable schools. So now, 
we're taking it into our own hands. It's, it's basically, if the government would not secure me, well, let's raise some people that can secure our, our, our children, pretty much. And now we're seeing, well, the government, who is, well, NSCDC, who is also part of the government, is training vigilantes to secure 821,000 vulnerable schools. But isn't this, isn't this the job of the police department, um, the Nigerian police force, isn't this their job? to ensure that they are securing the lives and properties of Nigerians and even the vulnerable children as well. What are they doing? And now that brings me to the point of state police because if I am seeing vigilantes, it means people in my local environment are taking the job of the police or taking the job of the security force that we probably need. Isn't that the reason why we should be looking at the state police that we're talking about? Just my thoughts. What do you think? Yeah, it is part of the same, but you see the responsibility that uh, of the police. But the police are literally handicapped. Uh, you know, they, they are poorly paid, uh, they are poorly equipped, they are poorly trained. So I think it is the government responsibility to do that. By the time the government shifts its focus on vigilante, it's creating a sort of a lot of problems. One, it is uh, the, you know uh, crippling the official security system that is the police uh, right. that are responsible uh, for these things constitutionally. So I think that instead of focusing on uh, vigilante, the government should take care of the police so that uh, they can adequately police the country. Uh, you know uh, that is the responsibility of the government. Now, the issue of uh, state policy, you know, we have to look at uh, both sides of it. Yes, by the time you have state policy, you are now localizing security challenges and people uh, will be able to, uh, they will know the perpetrators because they are from within the uh, community. And uh, you make it easier by decentralizing the system so that you don't have as a over centralization from the data. Sometimes some issues are local, you cannot uh, have to wait for uh, the center to do it. But by the time you put emphasis on this local policy, on uh, vigilantes, you are not creating a potential problem also, because they will now become an authority on their own. Uh, for example, what happened in uh, Zampara initially, you know, when the, when the issue of kidnapping and this started, it was, you know, compounded by the vigilante. So they took the law into their hands. Whenever they get any suspected, uh, suspicious person, a person who is suspected for doing that, they don't even take him to the authority there, and then they either kill him or they maim him. And uh, that one, you know, infuriated some people, and they began to take uh, arms against the, the vigilantes. And this is where we are. So I think there is a need uh, for the government to pay attention on, you know, equipping the police and, you know, training them and also uh, paying them well so that at least we don't have to go into the issue of uh, this vigilante thing. And the other thing is, uh, if we have police uh, and you say we are going to have state police, one consequence will be uh, you are overpowering, you are empowering the, the governors. Look at what the governors are doing with local government. So by the time they have police, uh, they will now abuse the system when election comes against their opponent. So I think we have to look at ways by which we can decentralize the policing system and also uh, equip it well and finance it well so that at least we'll have the motivation and the capability to address this issue of security challenges. Okay, so you talked about, um, you know, the state governors and what they do right now, and it could be an abuse of power if, you know, they, we start to do this whole state police thing that people are trying to um, put forward. But then we've seen the likes of Amotekun and what they've done. 
and we've seen how effective that has been. So isn't that, you know, a step in the right direction? Because it's one thing to be pessimistic and say, oh, you know, the state governors are going to abuse this and we don't know how it's going to be if we decentralize, you know, the, the police force. But shouldn't we be optimistic that this might actually work? In the, in the United States, for instance, you have the NYPD, you have the LAPD, you have all of these um, police departments that are peculiar to the state. And because definitely you know your environment, you know the nook and crannies um, of your state. And so even if, you know, kidnapping or stealing or um, whatever the case might be, any form of illegality happens, you can swing into action. So don't you think we should start to look at this from, the, from an optimistic lens than, be, than to be pessimistic and say it might just not work? And this is our final question for this because we have to wrap up the segment. I, I think we, we have to be optimistic that uh, this is the way. That is why I say when you decentralize, part of the decentralization is this way. Uh, when you mention uh, America, they have local government police, they have uh, state police, they have federal. In fact, even organizations have their own police. But what makes their own system work is that uh, the law of uh, this is uh, the law is above everybody, so there is rule of law. Unless you have rule of law, when you decentralize, you are going to empower this. So what I'm, I'm not against decentralization, but what I'm saying is decentralization should be subjected to rule of law. Whoever abuses it can be punished. So if you do that one, I think we are okay with the decentralization. Okay, fantastic. I think... Um one thing I'm going to take from this is the rule of law. So nobody is above the law. And if you um, are on the other side, if you're against the law, then you should be prosecuted. Anyways, this is where we're going to wrap it up on this segment. We want to thank you for joining us and reviewing the papers this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, we've been speaking to... Um, Professor Kamilu Sanifagi, and he was from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kano. And we've just been reviewing the papers and, you know, what the national dailies have been saying this morning. But we'll go on a short break. And when we return, we'll be looking at our first hot topic. Please stay with us. <laughs>